Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> Therefore, my brothers, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke folk, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Amen. Well, as Paul comes to give his final oration for us uh, this year, um, let me just pray with you, my brother. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you have laid on Paul's heart to share with this assembly of people. We thank you, Lord, that we have been well fed. We thank you, Lord, there has been much room for thought, contemplation, and a reason for us to change our attitudes and our hearts based on what the Word of God has said to us thus far. We ask, Lord, that as Paul preaches to us now, you'd give him your complete freedom in the Holy Spirit to really talk into our lives yet again with power and authority. For this we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, thank you, brother, and thank you for the... Um, invitation and the welcome to the convention this year. It's been good to be here. It's always great to minister in uh, the wonderful city of Birmingham. I mentioned this at the last two match sessions. Forgive me if I mention it one more time. Uh, we've got a, a training course beginning in uh, September this year. It's every Wednesday for about 30 Wednesdays a year. And a number of folk have asked about it. I've got some leaflets at the back. It's a Bible overview plus an in-depth in certain Bible books, plus doctrine, plus a whole lot of practical stuff. And um, it's for everybody, whatever your age, whatever your background, men and women, uh, young men and young women, older men and older women and everything in between. So you'd be very welcome to come along to that. Uh, great to see you all here tonight, uh, this afternoon. Um, very often this is the session where everybody's gone home for their tea. So you're all back. That's fantastic. It's wonderful to see you all. And... and um, can you listen for another 35 minutes? Can you manage that? Yes. You know, I hope so. I hope so. Um, you know the story about the preacher who, who thought that 35 minutes was the beginning of a sermon. Sermons were an hour. And he's in full flight and he's going to sort of his 55th minute. And he looks down and sitting near the front, there's a man and his wife. And the husband is fast asleep. 
And, and in absolute consternation, he points at the woman. He said, Madam, your husband is asleep. Wake him up. To which she responded, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope that we'll have a little bit of uh, ability to persevere this afternoon. If you've got your Bible there, turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 4 for the last session here in, in this wonderful book of Philippians. Uh, remember the context, Paul is in prison. He may be at the end of his life as far as he's aware, but maybe not. He's not sure. The future is very uncertain. And yet it bubbles over with joy. Bubbles over with joy because the the roots and the foundations of his experience and his joy and his hope and his everything is Christ. Having Christ, he has the solid rock on which to build his life. And it's a letter written to a church that is very precious to him. All sweetheart church. They've been shoulder to shoulder with him. They've had his back for 15 years, and now they've sent a gift. He mentions the gift in verse 10 of this chapter. I rejoice that at last you've been able to renew your fellow. You wanted to give me the gift before, but it's 400 miles away, and it's not always easy to do, but you've got here. I'm just so grateful. And so what he's doing here is giving them the last instructions. Here are the things that you need to do in the future. This is what you need to be a healthy Christian. This is what you need to have a healthy Christian experience in a Christian church. You need to be three things. You need to be vigilant. You need to be radiant, uh, radical. rather. You need to be contented. You are called to a life of vigilance, a life of uh, being radical, and a life of being contented. And, and, and the context is a kind of a um, someone speaking, thinking, I may never see you again. Now, it's not quite Paul's last words there in 2 Timothy. It's kind of like that, isn't it? And it's good to focus on that. We were thinking about that in the last session, that, that our lives are limited, and, and who knows how long we've got. My wife and I have four children. We have nine grandchildren. We've got a little grandson called uh, Boaz. Now, he's a bit of a wrecking ball. You know what they're like? Um, he, he comes to our house, and when we're finished, it takes us three days to put the house back together again. It's that sort of thing. When he was born, I took the advantage of, of teaching the story of Ruth to all my other grandkids. What a wonderful story, the story of Ruth. It's quite short. And it's about this brilliant bloke called Boaz who, 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 who cares for and protects and loves this woman called Ruth. It's a love story, really. Love story in the harvest time. And when I'd finished, two of my granddaughters were overheard talking to one another. And one said to the other, that was a great story, wasn't it? Granddad loved that story. And her sister said, yeah, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be great? When Boaz grows up, he meets a girl called Ruth, and they fall in love and they get married. Wouldn't that be great? And her sister said, Granddad would love that wedding. He'd be so excited at that wedding. And then she thought for a minute and she said, but he'll probably be dead by then. <laughs> so kids are fantastic, aren't they? They're brilliant. Uh, and the trouble is they, they, they may well get it right. Who knows? Our life is short and so on. And so we need, to, we need to take stock. And in the sense, that's what Paul is doing here. He's writing to these Christians and said, I, I may never see you again, but, but this is the kind of life you need to lead. These are the things you need to aim at. Number one, you need a vigilant life. If you're to flourish as a church and flourish as Christians, you need a vigilant life. That's in verses 1 to 3. Look at verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Notice there are six ways of describing these people. They're really on his heart. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, those I love, I'm ashamed to tell you that I love you. I long for you. I can't wait to see you again. You are my joy and my crown. You are my dear friends. There's a real passionate love for these Christians. And, and, and one of the marks of a real Christian church, one of the marks of any ministry is truth and love. And as you look at the word of God, those two things stand out. They stand out in this letter. Truth is vital. We thought earlier about the, the false teachers who are like dogs. Truth is important, but so is love. And some churches are brilliant at truth, and some churches are brilliant at love, and, and having both fully expressed, and, and pastors loving their congregations. If you're a minister or pastor today, do you love your congregation? Oh, <laughs> Well, well, can I tell you something? You should. <laughs> and if you're a member of a congregation, which I hope all of you are, part of a local church, do you love your pastor? Oh, goodness me. I'm, you know, 
slightly more enthusiastic. Well, that's what Paul, that's what Paul says. But did you notice, tucked away in there, tucked in away in there, he says, stand firm in the Lord. In the next couple of verses, he'll talk about contending. That's verse 3, contending for the faith, contending. He'll talk about a battle, spiritual battle. The word for contend there is the word from which we get the English word gladiator. You ever seen the film Gladiator? You know, when you go into the arena, what they say is those who are about to die salute you. Because in the arena, you either win or you're carried out on your shield. You, you've died. And he says, look, contend for the fact. There's a battle going on. Wake up. There's spiritual warfare. Why is it that we have so many issues in our culture today? Why is it that Christians are accused of being on the wrong side of history? Why is it difficult in, in a whole range of areas? Why is it difficult to preach the gospel openly in, in many of our contexts? Why is it difficult for people in schools and in universities and in hospitals and so Why? Because we have an enemy. Brothers and sisters, wake up. We are in a spiritual battle. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul has spoken about all the issues that can face Christians. And then he says, listen to me, we're not just fighting against flesh and blood. Behind this are the forces of darkness, the forces of, of spiritual darkness in the heavenly realms. We're in a battle, so put on the armor and stand firm. And brothers and sisters, don't give up. And we need one another for that, don't we? We need to be part of the church. We need the body of Christ. You can't be a single Christian on your own because you're vulnerable. I, I love doing kids' talks. Do you love kids' talks? I, I'm a bit too old for them now, but, but if I'm doing a kids' talk, and I'm not too sure, I asked my wife, and I came up with what I thought was a brilliant kids' talk. I said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, you know, you have a bag at the front, you say, what's in my bag? And the kids guess, and then you get out a chopper. And you say, now I want one of you children to come and put their hand out, I'm going to chop your finger off. And, and, and the idea is, I wouldn't actually do it, but, you know, I pretend to chop that and then pull out, I don't know, a, a, a fish finger and say, look, there you go. And, and the idea is that to say, look, if you cut the finger off, the, the body is hurt, but the finger is dead. Is that a good talk? My wife said, are you insane? <laughs> are you completely mad? <laughs> Get a life, mate, you know, sort of. Well, of course, of course I never did it. But it's a good talk, don't you think? I give you permission to use it, but uh, yeah, here's the point. If you chop off your finger, your body is hurt, and so on, but the finger's dead. Finger, you know, you can put it in the freezer and pull it out casually for children's talks, but it's dead. <laughs> and a Christian separated from the body is going to wither. That's why Paul, in the context of spiritual warfare, stand firm, we need one another. And then he talks about a particular problem. It's kind of the elephant in the room. Look at verse 2. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche, but of the same mind in the Lord. Back in chapter 2, he's spoken about being humble and being united and living in harmony. And now he says, and, and in particular, here is an issue that we need to deal with. Now, I don't think he's changed his subject when he goes from verse 1 to verse 2. How is it that the devil often attacks the church and destroys the unity of the church? It's by bringing about division between Christians. When Christians are disunited, then that gives a, a place for the devil to come in. So verse 2, I plead, I urge, I beseech these two women to be one in the Lord. Now, we don't know what's going on exactly. They are godly women. They're contenders for the faith, he says in verse 2. Their names are written in heaven. It's clear that they're women, but for some reason they've fallen out. And it's such a terrible thing, but it's actually heard 800 miles away in Rome. I mean, the tragedy is that these two women are known for two things, nothing else in the Bible except they fell out. That's a terrible thing to think about. The way in which the disunity of the church can have ripples into the community. I was preaching once in a little village chapel in, in Wiltshire. And I arrived early and I couldn't find the church. So I, I kind of walked up and down the high street, still couldn't find it, and I saw a bloke cleaning his car. So I said to him, look, I can't find this church. Can you tell me where it is? Oh, he says it's difficult to find. You go down there, you see those trees, go past the trees. You'll see a little track. Go down the track and just down there you'll see the church. And then he said, but you don't want to go there. In that church, they hate one another. Can you imagine? In that church, and this was obviously not a church goer, but he knew what was going on in that church. Listen to me, the context in which you minister, the context in which your church flourishes, 
The context in which Birmingham City flourishes, or any ministry flourishes, is unity amongst the Lord's people. And when that falls down, when that's broken, he gives a gateway for the devil to come in, and your witness is destroyed. So stand firm, he says, be careful, be vigilant, keep your eyes open. Forgive one another, put it right. It's no accident that 21 letters in the New Testament, 21 letters, all address the issue of the way in which Christians relate to one another. Every one of them. You can find it in every letter. Why? Because it's important, and two, because it's difficult. So here's, the, here's another thing to take away from today. Our brother prayed that we might take something today, away today. Is there anything or anyone in your church you need to go and apologize to? And what Jesus says, and you're offering your sacrifice in the altar, in your relationship with God, and you remember your brother's got something against you, go and put it right with him before you continue. Your relationship with God can't be right if your relationship with your brother is wrong. Number one, it's a vigilant life. Number two, from verse three down to verse nine, it's a radical life. Christian life is a radical life. What you've got in verses four to nine are a series of final exhortations. They're kind of rapid fire, staccato, bang, 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 bang. A series of them, and, and we're very familiar with them. Lots of people say to me, that these are my favorite verses. I love these verses about rejoicing and not being anxious and having the peace of God that passes all understanding and set your mind on things above and so on and so on and so on. They're very familiar, but when you think about it, these commands, humanly speaking, are impossible. They're a series of impossible imperatives. Without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't do any of these things. Rejoice all the time. Have a life that's always filling over with joy. Be reasonable with everyone. Well, I can be reasonable with them, but them? Really? I want to be re- I'm not talking about you guys literally, but you know, you get the idea. Be reasonable with everybody. Don't be anxious. Never be anxious. Don't worry. Only have wholesome thoughts. They're outrageously impossible without the Holy Spirit. But of course, Paul says, you've got the Holy Spirit. So this is the kind of life you need to live. And you can summarize them in four things. Number one, be joyful. Be joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. He's already said that in chapter 3 and verse 1. And now he says it in stereo in chapter 4. And verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Joy, joy is not an optional extra. It's not that some Christians are joyful and some are not. Joy is a blessing and a gift and a command and a duty. If you're not a joyful Christian, you're not what God intends you to be. Remember when Paul describes the fruit of the Spirit? And he's describing the balanced Christian life, what a Christian life should look like. And he goes through these nine fruit, which actually amount to one fruit. It's singular in the Greek. He's not saying, well, you get to pick and choose. You know, I fancy peace, but I'm not so sure as about self-control. Now, all of these nine are a picture of the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Do you remember? Love, number two, joy. So if we're not joyful, we're disobedient. You know, some Christians think that being a Christian is very solemn and very serious, and that means it's joyless and miserable. That's not true. It is solemn. It is serious. <laughs> There's a world to win for Christ, but at the same time, we're joyful. The problem is we, we misunderstand what joy is. Joy is not just temperamental. Do you know what I mean by that? Some people are just naturally jolly. Do you know the kind of people I mean? They're just, they're just, they're just like that. That's the way they're made. They get up every morning at six o'clock and they throw back the curtains and they think, oh, what a beautiful morning. Do you know people like that? Don't you hate their guts? <laughs> you know, that's not real joy in the Bible. That's just temperament. And it's not circumstantial, which it means it's not dependent on your circumstances. Paul's in prison. He's facing an uncertain future. He doesn't know what happens next. And said, I'm rejoicing all the time. Joy all the time in this letter. He runs through it like, like Blackpool Rock. I never stop having joy. It's not circumstances. You can have tears in your eyes and joy in your heart. It's not even emotional. It's something deeper than that. And joy is, is, is based upon our relationship with Christ. Joy is something that can never be taken away because it's not based on our circumstances or our temperament, it's independent. Let me give you a definition of joy. Joy is a deep-seated confidence of God, a humble expectation that God is at work in all things for our good. Joy is a holy happiness in the Lord. A holy happiness 
in the world. I'm happy to be a Christian, aren't you? Wow. <laughs> Birmingham's in trouble. If this, is, if this is a good selection of Christians from Birmingham, the city is in trouble. Aren't you happy to be a Christian? Yeah, yeah. Happy, happy isn't a bad word. Oh, I'm holy, I'm not happy. I'm ho Listen, true holiness always leads to true happiness. They're not separate, they're the same thing. To be holy is to be happy in the Lord. Spurgeon, who was the great Baptist preacher in London, um, his service is quite dual. They didn't have musical instruments, but there was a wonderful effervescent joy in his preaching. People loved it. Well, some of them did. One lady came from a very um, exclusive kind of strict Baptist background. She came to listen to Spurgeon preach, and it, it offended her deeply. And she wrote to him saying, Mr. Spurgeon, I was with you on Sunday. I think you were far too frivolous. I'm going to find a church that is more suitably miserable. I could take her to a few churches like that. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord. Be joyful. There's the first command in a radical life. Number two, it's be contented, or rather um, be, be gentle. Look at the next verse. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Be a gentle person, full of gentleness. The joyful life is the gentle life. What does it mean to be gentle? Well, it means to be like the Lord. Be like Jesus. Come to me, he says. All who are weary, heavy, like, I will give you rest for my heart is gentle. Gentle and lowly. If Jesus dealt with us according to our sins, we'd be finished. But he comes to us gentle. And as Christians, we're called to be gentle with one another. Sometimes, because we are evangelicals and we believe in the truth, and the truth is important, the gospel's important, we contend for the gospel, we use the gospel like a cudgel to hit other people's heads. That's actually what often wins people's hearts is a gentleness of approach. In your evangelism, not to be in people's faces, you know, fists up, but gently pointing them to Christ, and, and in our relationships with one another. My first church had brethren roots, and so communion, the Lord's table, was really important. And at the front, we had a beautiful polished table, beautiful polished table. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and uh, I remember one day, I'd only just become the pastor, we were in the, in the service, or in the, in the church, I got a cup of coffee, and I put my cup on the table. <laughs> And one of the elders came straight to me and said, what kind of example are you setting? That's the Lord's table. We do not put cups on the Lord's table. Okay, well, I learned. <laughs> one Sunday, we, we had a, an evening service, and we had a couple coming to the church. It was a, it was a mother and her son. And um, that they had learning difficulties. They, they both struggled with all sorts of things. And they came into church late, and the church was full. The only place was, was the front row. And they'd been shopping, they'd been to Lidl, and they got their shopping bags. <laughs> and they walked to the front, and they kind of looked round. And then, in front of the whole congregation, as we're singing the hymn, they put their shopping on the holy table. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this elder moving <laughs> like an exocet missile. It's like Jaws. Dun -dun 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 I, I see his hands, but I think he's going for his gun. And then I thought, this is in America. And he goes across them, I think, in front of the whole church. Everybody's here. He goes across to them and he whispers something into their ear. And they, they smile and nod. He picks up their shopping, takes it to the back, outside. And I said to him, what on earth did you say? He said, how oh, lovely that you've come to church tonight. We're so pleased you're here. I'm going to take your shopping on and put it in the fridge at the back. And then afterwards, I'm going to take you home in my car. That's gentleness. That's grace, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing grace. If I'd done it, I'd be dead now, but, but you know, <laughs> dealing with people in different ways. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near. It may be talking about the coming of the Lord, but what it probably means is that Jesus is there physically, or spiritually rather, in the midst of his church. Whenever we gather, the Lord is there. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. We're in his midst all the time. Number three, be prayerful. Be prayerful. Look at verses 6. And seven, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Again, impossible, humanly speaking. Now, Paul isn't here talking about being careless or carefree. It's not a kind of a detachment. Nothing troubles me. Sometimes if we are passionately concerned about something, it does get us, doesn't it? There is such a thing as, as genuine concern and genuine care. Uh, and it's a proof of love. 
You love somebody, you'll be concerned. If your children aren't believers and they're going away from the Lord, it concerns you. It's a matter of constant prayer. Maybe that's some of you today. You think, well, should I, should, I, should I not have care? Of course you should. But it's easy for care to tip over, legitimate concern to become paralyzing fear. What happens then? Our soul, it, it, our soul is sapped by anxiety. And we get to the point where we can't pray anymore and, and our faith is in the negative and, 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 and it's almost as if God is no longer there. Paul says you shouldn't be like that. God has provided something to help you to do with anxiety. And I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. Please don't do that. But how many here have experience of anxiety? Most of you. I said don't put your hands up, but you're allowed to if you like. All of us actually. All of us in one way or another. And some of us fairly seriously. We get anxious about all sorts of things because we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable in our bodies. We're vulnerable in our family relationships. We're vulnerable in our careers. Whatever it is, we can have concerns and care. So what do we do? What's God's solution? Tell you what God doesn't do. He doesn't wave a magic wand over and say, oh, the curse disappeared. He says, you've got to do something. What have you got to do? Well, the answer is there in verse 6. In everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. Four different words here. The first word is prayer. And the word prayer there in, in Greek literally means coming before the face of God. Coming into God's presence. Knowing that God accepts me. Knowing that God's my father as we sang earlier. Knowing that God loves me. I'm coming directly into God's presence. Prayer. And then the second word, if you look at it, is the word petition. And the word petition is basically a humble, earnest cry. It's crying out to God. Oh, God, help me. In my life, I think the most effective prayers have not been the wonderful, eloquent prayers of ministers. They've been, oh, Lord, please help me. Oh, Lord, you know my heart. It's not a matter of technique. I pour out my heart to the Lord. And then it's mixed with thanksgiving, you'll notice. It's punctuated with praise, remembering that God hears us and God's in control and God will answer and he'll never let us go. And then requests. Requests are specific things. Coming to God with a list of things. So how do you deal with anxiety? What's the Bible's answer? And this is what it is. If you want to deal with anxiety, when you go home tonight, get a piece of paper and write down everything you're afraid about. Okay, the things, the big things, and the little things, every one of them. You know, you can put in things that are insignificant and unimportant, but they're important to you. And when you've got that list, that's your worry list, turn it into your prayer list. Does that sound radical? Does that sound simple? It's easier, easier said than done, but that's what you've got to do. Take your worry list, turn it into your prayer list. But here's the key. When you give it to the Lord, you've got to leave it with the Lord. Remember the psalm we used to sing? All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. problem is we bring it to God, we pick it up, and we go away again. And we keep caring. You've got to keep giving. And sometimes it means throwing it on the Lord day after day after day. You pray about something and you give it to the Lord. And you give it to the Lord again and again and again. When I was growing up, my great anxiety was for my mum and dad to become Christians. My dad became a Christian when I was 18, but not my mum. That went on for years and years and years. And she actually said when my dad died, I'm never going to church again. Never want to go to the church ever again. And um, you couldn't talk to her about the Lord. I prayed every day. And sometimes I've got to say, I almost gave in. I almost say, no, Lord, you're not going to answer this. It's just too much. Day after day after day. Then she became ill. And I thought it was the end. So I went to see her. And I prayed as I went. And then I sat with her and I held her hand and I said, Mom, could I ask you a question? She said, yes. I said, do you know where Dad is? She said, he's in heaven. And I said, you know how he got there? She said, no. I said, do you want me to tell you how he got there? And normally she'd say, no, I don't want any of that. She said, yes, please. So I told her the way of salvation. I told her about how Christ died for sinners. How he died for a man who was hung next to him on a cross who had no future and no hope except for Jesus. And he cried to Jesus, remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When I'd finished her telling her that story, she looked at me and she said, you think God would accept me? I said, you bet. And so we prayed. And I know she was saved, 
because the first thing she wanted to do when she was out of the hospital, she didn't die. I thought she would, but she didn't. She was in a wheelchair, very weak. First thing she wanted to do was to go to church. And I remember the first time that I was there with her in church and we had communion and we're sitting together and she's there and I'm here and they're coming with the bread and the wine and she looks down and she goes, <laughs> don't give up. Don't give up. Keep praying. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there and then the peace of God, the supernatural peace of God that passes all understanding will fill your hearts and minds. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. How can you have peace in that situation? Because I'm resting in Jesus. It's his problem. I've given it to him. I don't have to bear it anymore. And then one last thing, one last thing in this radical life, one last thing. Be careful, verses 8 and 9. Be careful about what you think about. Christian life is the battle for the mind. We're not what we think we are, but what we think we are. Do you get that? You're writing it down. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> We're not what we think we are, but what we think we are. The Bible talks about renewing our mind, and he gives them a checklist. Is it true? It's a cacophony of voices all around us, people trying to get our attention. Is it true? Is it according to God's word? Does God say so? If God says it, that settles it. Is it noble or honourable, or is it cheap and sleazy? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it uh, amiable? Think about those things. Keep your mind on those things. Well, it's the kind of, um, um, what she called, uh, not Mary Poppins, it was the other one, Maria in The Sound of Music. Is that the same person, really? But you've seen The Sound of Music? <laughs> Is there a Christian on planet Earth who hasn't seen The Sound of Music? You know, it's the one film every Christian's allowed to watch. And, um, <laughs> and when the kids are terrified because of the nightmare, what does she tell them to do? Sing. What do they sing about? Raindrops on roses and whiskers. Think about nice things. Now, don't think about raindrops or roses. Don't even think about kittens because, you know, ugh. But, but, but think about, think about the things that, that through your heart. You want your mind to be purified. Well, it's not just Christian stuff. You can think about all sorts of things. Think about the wonderful creation God has made. Think about how fantastic it is to live in the city of Birmingham. And, and think of all those things. Think that, that actually it's even nice to live in the black country. But, but all of those things. But in the end, what you fill your mind with is the truth of who Christ is and the glory of the gospel. You know, I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. I have been justified. I'm right with God. There's no record of my sin. I'm holy before a holy God through the righteousness of Christ. I'm being sanctified. I'm being changed every day by the power of the Spirit. I will be glorified. One day I will have a new resurrection body. God, the creator of the ends of the earth, is my Father. He's my Father in heaven and he loves me. And he moves heaven and earth to protect me. Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, is my saviour. He's my king, he's my brother, he's my master, he's my friend. He prays for me. And, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, dwells within me. He's the advocate. When I don't know what to pray, he helps me to pray. I've got the church, the body of Christ all around me. I've got the word of God with its promises. I'm, sec I'm secure, I'm safe, I'm satisfied forever and ever. What a glorious gospel. Fill your mind with those things. Fill your mind with Christ. Think of him in all his majesty and all his beauty. Think about those things. Purify your mind. And then look at verse 9. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it in practice and the God of peace will be with you. Do you want to know this supernatural peace? Well, be in good, harmonious relationship with your brothers and sisters. Work hard at that. And, and rejoice always and be gentle and know that you're in God's presence and pray and give it to the Lord and fill your mind with, with all those wonderful things and then you won't have time to worry because you'll be filled with peace. One last thing and then we're done. Can I have five more minutes? Is that all right? Yep. Okay, good, thank you. He said so, That's, so blame him now. So just five more minutes, a contented life, verses 10 to 13, a contented life. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no, no, no opportunity to show. No, it's talking here about the gift they sent. Thank you so much for that gift. I mean, it took a while to get here because it's 800 miles away and it's not easy to do so, but you've done it. And I thank God because you're such a blessing to me. And then he says something amazing. But I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. In other words, he's not kind of saying, you know, you shouldn't have bothered, but he's saying if you hadn't got it to me, I'd still be contented. 
It doesn't bother me that I don't have much. Next verse, I, I know what it is to have lots and have nothing. I know what it is to be well fed and I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be in all sorts of circumstances. Some are good and some are bad. Whatever happens in my life, I have contentment. Well, I think that's an amazing statement. We live in the most discontented world today, don't we? You, know, you look at the advertising industry, it's all you need this and you need this and you need it, and you can't be content unless you've got this, unless your car is like this, unless your house is like this, and yes, you've got this wonderful relationship, you know, the perfect person, the perfect wife, or the perfect husband. My, my wife said to me, I was always looking for Mr. Wright, and when I married you, I, I realised your first name was always. But... Uh, <laughs> Think about it. But anyway, anyway, you know, the perfect relation, the perfect, perfect, oh, oh, wonderful. And, and we are so discontented. And our kids are growing up discontented. And they're going online and they're getting smartphones at age 13. And what does it do? It feeds a spirit of discontentment. And the whole of our culture is built on discontentment. Paul says, you know what? I've learned to be totally, totally satisfied. Totally contented, because my contentment doesn't depend on my circumstances. I can have a lot, I can have nothing. In fact, in Philippi, it was exactly like that. He, he, he started off by, by spending some time in the home of Lydia, this wealthy businesswoman. She had this, imagine this kind of palatial house. It was wonderful. You know, they've got his and hers towels on the towel rack. And that, that weird stuff that they put on tables. You know when you're in a posh house and they've got this little bowl and it looks like crisps, but it smells of perfume? What do they call that? Pot pure, yeah, that kind of stuff. And you know you're in a smart place when he's got that stuff because it's totally pointless, isn't it? I tried eating it once, don't try. You know, it's, it, you know, but he'd had that experience, fantastic. And then by the end of his time in Philippi, he's been stripped and beaten and thrown in prison. And you know what he's doing in prison? Oh, poor me. He's singing at midnight. Him and Silas are singing and then suddenly there's an earthquake. God, God joins in on the bass line. <laughs> And amazingly, he set. And he said, "I know both of those things. I know what it is to go through both of those things. And in most of our lives, we have both of those things." He said, "My contentment doesn't depend on my circumstances. My contentment depends on Christ. I can do all things through Christ, through Him, who strengthens me." It's all about Jesus. Remember what we said on the first night. There are 104 verses in Philippians, 50 references to Jesus. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I want to have the mind of Christ, who was God and emptied himself and became a servant and died on a cross. I, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sufferings. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's the secret of supernatural peace, supernatural contentment, knowing Jesus. Whatever the world takes from you, it can't take Jesus. My first church, we had a lady missionary, a retired lady. Her husband had died many years before. She'd worked with Amy Carmichael in India. And uh, when she died, I conducted the funeral, and her son stood up to give the eulogy. And he said, uh, my mum was the finest Christian we've ever known. He said, when, when we came to her little room, she, she'd spent her last few years in a, in a Christian care home. When we came to her little room, we found a couple of changes of clothes, a few books, a very, very well-thumbed Bible, a few knickknacks, and nothing else. When we looked at a bank account, there was just enough for a funeral. As far as this world's goods are concerned, as far as this world's pleasures are concerned, my mum had nothing. But it never worried her, because we know that all her life, my mum was totally satisfied with Jesus. Isn't that a great thing for someone to say at your funeral? Totally satisfied with Jesus. And Paul says, you can have that. It's not out of reach, not distance, it's not something impossible to know Christ, to know the assurance of Christ, to know him as your Savior and your King and your friend forever and ever. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen.